Now you've seen an application of the central limit theorem that's fairly well understood and widely used, the, the hedge fund. I wanted to show you a limitation of the central limit theorem and uh, how catastrophic it can be when the, the required conditions of the central limit theorem don't actually apply, but it's used. In particular, remember the requirement that the random variables have to be independent. That is, knowledge of one of the random variables doesn't tell you anything about any of the other random variables because they're all operating independently. So this is an important story because it's at the heart of what went wrong with mortgage-backed securities in the 2007-2008 time, time frame that created such a problem worldwide. So let me tell you a little story about that and you can see how things went wrong. This is the conflux of two political currents, and I'm not here to make any political statements. Um, at the same time, the Democratic Party was talking about getting more and more people to own homes so they had a stake in society. The Republican Party was talking about less government intervention in business and therefore letting banks do what banks wanted to do and let the market decide. So you had the confluence of these two things. Democratic pressure to offer more people home loans, Republican pressure to reduce government oversight. So here's what happened. It's a simplified version, but it's true in its essential details. Suppose in the past I wanted to borrow money for a house. What would happen is I would go to the bank. I would say, this is my income. These are my obligations. Here are my taxes. So at each month, here is what I have after tax and after prior existing obligations. And the bank would look at how much money that was, and they would say, based on their multipliers and their um, prognosis of my employability and everything, we could give you a loan up to a certain amount based on monthly payments, given how much money you have after taxes and existing debt. And that worked for a long time. The problem is, under those circumstances, um, there were a number of people who could not get loans for a house and thus were subjected to living in apartments or rental status and didn't have a home. Remember these two political events I said coming together? Well, in the 2000s, what happened is I could now go to the bank and I could say, I want to buy this particular home. And even though by the old calculations, I wouldn't be able to afford the mortgage cost of that loan. By the new political will, there was a desire to give me a loan and a lack of oversight on the bank giving me a loan. So the bank said, sure, we'll give you this loan. We'll give you a loan for $200,000. Normally your income levels couldn't support that, but we'll give you a loan for $200,000 and we'll give you an adjustable rate mortgage. Early on in the loan, you'll have a very small interest rate, therefore your payments will be low, but after five years they will revert to whatever the terms and conditions are based in the contract and your, your um, cost will go up, but by then your job will have progressed, you'll be making more money and you'll be able to afford it. Now that was the premise of giving me this loan. The problem is, is that once the bank had given me this loan, they knew it was a risky loan. And banks Local banks rarely hold on to mortgages. What they do is they actually sell mortgages onto the secondary market to other people who buy them. And so the bank is trying to figure out how to get rid of this risky loan that they gave to Brit. It's risky because there's a fairly significant chance that I won't be able to pay it back because if anything goes wrong, my job may end, I may have no job, or I may not be able to pay the increased rate when the adjustable rate kicks in. So what happened is these banks got together with investment houses, such as Goldman Sachs. They were explicitly named in this. And Goldman Sachs came up with an investment strategy that says, let's create a mortgage-backed security. Let's buy a number of these securities from all over the country. Let's package them together and let's use the central limit theorem. I am going to grab a risky loan from Brit in Austin, another risky loan from someone in Houston, another risky loan from someone on the West Coast, the East Coast. Eventually it spread overseas as well. And what we'll do is we'll package 
many of these risky loans together and call it a pooled loan. And we know from the central limit theorem that um, by pooling things together, the overall pooled group, the security, is more predictable than the individual elements that are going into it. So Brit may be risky, but when we put a lot of Brits together, as long as all of those conditions of the central limit theorem are met and everything's independent, the actual portfolio is actually fairly predictable. And then we're going to sell it to institutional investors. Um, this all makes sense. I mean, it's certainly true. The basic arguments are true in that, in that particular case, with one exception. It is absolutely essential in the central limit theorem that the individual elements are independent of each other. That is, the likelihood of Brit not being able to pay back his loan is unrelated to the likelihood of some person in San Francisco or some other person in New York who's also in this portfolio. Now, as long as we're independent, the central limit theorem works. The problem is, if you stop and think about it, there are business cycles. And when there's a business cycle, it tends to cause a downturn in the economy, not just in Austin, Texas, not just in Texas, but across the whole country. And not just in one country, but often across country borders. And that's exactly what happened in this central, in this, uh, poor application of the central limit theorem. These securities were marketed as a central limit theorem security where their risk was lower than the individual risk of, of the pieces of the element. The central limit theorem was applied and people paid prices for these based on high return and low risk because of the pooling effect. The problem was, of course, that the random variables, my ability to pay, other people's ability to pay, were not independent. And when the economy had one of its in inevitable blips, it simultaneously affected many of the people in the portfolio. They all went down at the same time. The central limit theorem did not apply. And the true risk was higher than the calculated risk. Therefore, people who had bought these securities had paid too much for them. Because when you buy a security, you pay based on the ratio of the coefficient of variation. What is the riskiness or uncertainty of the payback versus what is the mean expected return? So what happened is people had paid prices for these based on high return and low risk, but it turned out to be high risk. They had overpaid, now they couldn't get rid of them. There were other problems too. Um, the very firms such as Goldman Sachs that were um, providing these securities to their clients were at the same time betting against their, their clients. They were saying, they're buying this, I'm betting they shouldn't have bought it. And they were putting particular kinds of financial instruments against them, which helped create a worse crisis. But at the heart, this was a failure of the central limit theorem, or at least a failed application of the central limit theorem, because the risks were not independent as required. So please keep that in mind as we use the central limit theorem. It's very powerful. It tells us about risk pooling. It explains hedge funds. It explains inventory. It explains project management uncertainty. But it all depends upon independence. And if you violate that constraint, the central limit theorem is not applicable.